I want to take a minute to um, introduce our next speaker. I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier this morning that I was really excited to have uh, Louis Oliveira come and talk to you. Um, he is the uh, chief engineer at uh, California State University, Stanislaus. And he's got 20 years of experience in this field. Um, before going to uh, Stanislaus, he was actually involved in the uh, startup team that started the brand new uh, University of California Merced campus and uh, was involved in some pretty sophisticated energy management um, programs that they used to run and operate that campus, a um, pretty sophisticated BAS system. And I think it reflects in what he's been doing at Cal State Stanislaus because when he showed me um, the program that they were using to water management, uh, to, to, to um, manage their water systems on campus, and integrate that um, with the other building systems. I'm like, that's really uh, very high end and an excellent application of BAS utility and integration in a campus environment. I'd love for you to share that with the faculty coming to our institute. And so he was willing to do that and um, we appreciate his interest in supporting the, the work that we do in showing you some really great best practices that are out there and they've won awards for um, the work that they've done on this campus. So uh, with that said, I'd just like to, um, to, oh, and I forgot to mention too, he was also in the uh, program that we did for high performance building operations professionals in that training. And he, you know, although he has so much knowledge on his own, he uh, was able to um, still benefit from that 12 week training period, which also, also to me, I think is a sign of, um, intelligent people who know that there's still more to learn out there, and so uh, we appreciate him coming. <laughs> also affiliated with, uh, how many of you are familiar with the Association of Facilities Engineering? A few of you. Okay, well it's interesting to understand the profile, but he also has his uh, CPMM certification through that organization, and uh, we have just also been having some discussions with them as well in aligning with the training that we've developed for the HPBOP. So, Anyway, with that said, I want to bring uh, Louis on so that he can share with you his um, <coughs> innovative solution to water <laughs> management at Cal State Stanislaus. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm probably going to yeah. not use that. I'm not big on microphones. Can you guys hear me in the back? A little bit? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what's, what we've done at Stanislaus State University. Um, a couple, three, about three years ago, we were at the height of the drought and the governor uh, had issued a mandate that you shall reduce water consumption by 25%, period. And so we looked around the campuses because how are we going to do this? And so um, we have a pretty interesting water collection system on campus and I kind of go through it real quick with you. But um, we took a resource that was basically just there and not really being used effectively or, or monitored or managed properly. And we're using it in ways that are actually pretty cool right now. And so, and it's all controlled and operated by uh, Automated Logic. This is our campus BAS system. I came to the campus five years ago and uh, started to convert the campus from a very old, um, um, inadequate system and brought on Automated Logic. And when we applied Automated Logic controls to the water system that we have on campus, it was actually a big eye opener for us. Uh, we knew it was there, we knew things were going on, but we didn't realize that this is a bigger resource than we thought. And so uh, we've done some pretty cool things with it and I hope you, um, I hope you, you, uh, you see it. Um, Stanislaus State University um, is located in the Central Valley and at Stanislaus we really redefine the importance of this resource. Uh, we have a, an elaborate um, underground stormwater system that collects all the rainfall that falls on the campus, regardless mm -hmm. if it comes off the roofs, sidewalks, parking lots, streets, mm -hmm. it all is directed to one central location. Um, this ingenious system was actually developed not by anybody that's presently there, it was done back in the 1960s because the campus was built in a location away from the city and they had to control and manage their own stormwater. And so they had to put something in place. And another thing that doesn't help either is that, or maybe it helps this system is that the campus sits slightly lower than the rest of the city, so we have to manage our stormwater. And so we've come, come up uh, with uh, a way to control this resource and really put it to, uh, to work with us. 
Um, Stanislaus State University is one of 23 campuses statewide. We are located in the Central Valley, established and started in the 1960s, about 220 acres and roughly 10,000 students and growing. And we're really uh, a beautiful campus, 220 acres of large landscape areas. We have over 4,000 over 4, trees on this campus. It's been called an urban forest or a park with buildings in it. Well, the problem with all that is there's a lot to maintain. <laughs> And so, uh, and a lot of water to maintain it. Uh, one of the key things about this campus is the series of lakes. There's five lakes that we use as storage vessels uh, to store all this water that comes out of the sky. And um, the last few days, we've had our share of it. And so, um, this is a quick, uh, I'm, let me go back on this. First lake is a reflection pond, and this is the largest lake on campus. And this is where all the water uh, is pumped into. It's about five million gallons of capacity. It sits at the front of the campus. And this is our main storage lake. And that, the other one that we use for storage is Warrior Lake. It's on the east end of the campus. And these lakes not only are used for, for obviously storage, but they're also very beautiful to, um, to look at because they really create a nice environment on the campus. A lot of these buildings, that's student housing back there. You overlook in the lakes. Um, and also a lot of work to maintain. Um, the other lake is Sequoia Lake. Sequoia Lake is a favorite of the community around there. You, you uh, always, often see wedding parties, all kinds of photography going on on the banks of this lake on a weekend. So uh, about a half, about a 1.5 million gallons of capacity. A village lake, this is a view out of our offices, and uh, another lake that we use for storage. The system is really simple. I mean, rain falls, it's collected through a pumping station, it's powered by uh, electricity, obviously pumps, and backed up by a solar array, water stored in lakes, it's used for irrigation, and now the cooling tower. And that's, that's the thing I'm excited about. We're actually cooling our campus with collected rainwater uh, on the cooling towers. And, um, and again, a little bit more detail on this. Um, a series of underground pipes, storm drains, all directs all the rainfall that's, that falls on the campus. We also collect all the rainfall and runoff from the city streets on our side of the campus. So that's a lot of water. And all directed to the pumping station. Pumping station is, um, houses a series of large pumps, 8,000 gallons a minute capacity each. They're all controlled by automated logic, and as the level rises in the storm chamber, it starts a se sequence of pumps and starts to store water into the lakes. Um, powered again by, po by electricity, backup generator for emergencies, and also a solar array, which is a small percentage, but solar array. Um, water stored in the lakes, um, and then from, uh, from there, um, it is uh, from the main lake, it's transferred to the other lake. So we have about a 14 million gallon capacity full at full, full level. So quite a bit, quite a bit of water, but not quite enough. And so uh, we're trying to improve that and find uh, additional storages. We use this water primarily for irrigation. Uh, we we'll probably use nearly 100 million gallons of water a year to irrigate this campus. It's, I live in, 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 in uh, work in the Central Valley. It's common to have 105 degrees in the summer months. No rain from April to October, and that's on a wet year. <laughs> so we have to do something different. Um, cooling tower, as of 2015, this cooling tower, as you know, cooling towers use a lot of water. This one happens to use about 5 million gallons a year, and that was domestic drinking water. And not only it's a waste of domestic drinking water, it's also expensive. And so we converted the tower to use this reclaimed lake water. And we had to do a couple of things to, to, to make it work, but we're now literally cooling 1.2 million square feet of campus uh, with the cooling tower and using rainwater and, which is, uh, and lake water, which is really interesting. A real quick overview of the system to control all this. We use automated logic. This is actually a screenshot. This is a series of the, of the storm pumps in that uh, pumping uh, station. And uh, automated logic is a really cool program because it not only gives you a ton of information, it controls these pumps. It, it, it's, uh, It'll start and stage them in sequences as water rises and drops in the, in the chamber. Um, on a given day, this, I can literally pump millions of gallons of water. This particular day at the top, if you can see the numbers, 554,000 gallons that one day. The next day, the previous day was 1.7 million. You go down here, the, the previous year, 24 million gallons of water. That's the, only the water that we were able to pump and store. Not the water that was too much to store and we had to pump off campus. And that stuff is gone. We don't see it back. So this is the other set of pumps. This pump, when Automated Logic sees the levels of the lakes rise to a point where they're full, starts this pump. 
There's water coming in, we gotta get rid of it. So this pumps water onto the regional storm system, which that water is gone forever. It goes out to the river, into the ocean, we don't get it back. We're working on a project to camp that water on campus, and I'll show you at the end. So, but again, millions of gallons. This one 24-hour period today, 1.2 million. The day before, 835,000. You know, year to date, 12 million gallons. We move a lot of water, and so and this is a great resource for us. Um, we also have a deep well. I mean, there are times where we, it doesn't rain, and we still use water. So we have an 800 gallon per minute uh, agricultural well controlled by automated logic. And that replenishes the lakes when we don't have rainwater. And so, and unfortunately, that's something that we have to do, but um, we're trying to make sure we replace some of that water that we pump out when there is no rain. And I'll show that at the end. Um, literally millions of gallons of water uh, that is moved through the system. But um, uh, one of the things that is really cool about this on days like this, this program has the ability to look into the future for on, into the forecast, eight to 10 days ahead. And if it sees rain in the forecast, it will actually adjust the lake levels to make sure there's ample capacity to store the water. Otherwise, it goes off campus. And so I, it, and it'll actually change the set points on its own, which is actually very interesting. Um, some of the things that, um, that uh, how, we, how we use this water is, is really simple. Once we have all this water stored, we have a series of pumps controlled by automated logic and filters that take the water from the lake, filters it, pressurizes the campus loop, and from that loop, we provide irrigation water for the campus. We also provide water for the cooling towers. And so, um, and, and it, like any other um, portion of the control system, it monitors daily activity, it monitors previous day, month, previous month, year to date, previous year. And you can go back and trend this stuff. And so, uh, and really, the information is really valuable to us. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we do is, um, is kind of unique to the campus because of the way the campus is laid out during irrigation season there's a lot of water that's being pumped uh, to the sprinklers and I don't care how good you are at irrigating you're always gonna have runoff over the sidewalk or a broken sprinkler or over irrigating we collect all that runoff in most city streets out there when it goes down the gutter and into the, the is gone well all that water comes back to the lake because it doesn't go anywhere else so we measure that as well. And we know how much water, more or less, are we, are we uh, bringing back as, a, as an over-irrigating or broken sprinkler or, or something like that. And when you're irrigating 220 uh, acres, it's a lot of water. But you know, it's not uncommon to, to pump and bring back 100,000 gallons in a 24-hour period. They would have, otherwise would have been gone um, down the storm system and, and gone. So we collect all that as well and measure it. Cooling tower. Cooling tower, when we converted it, we saved approximately 5 million gallons of water. That was 20% of the governor's mandate. The governor said, you shall reduce by 25%. And by this one project, we did 20%. So it was like, phew, because I don't know how we're going to do it without it. And so uh, we were really excited about that. But we can't just take lake water and uh, dump it into a million dollar chiller. It's a little weird. So we had to put a filter in place. It's a three-stage filter. The, the largest vessel there is a particle filter. It micro, uh, filters water down to five microns. It goes through a UV filter for uh, killing the biological organisms. It softens it. By the time it leaves that filter, it is clear as tap water. And we tested that theory. We took a cup of tap water and we took a cup of filtered water. We put them side by side and it was tough to see which was which. Because I want to make sure this water is clean. Because uh, you know these towers, as you know, cooling towers you know, they, they need clean water. And so uh, we were very pleased with it. There's a little bit of maintenance, obviously, to them and cost. But um, man, being able to uh, uh, run this water to the tower was, was a big plus for us. We, meet it, we, we measure everything. We capture everything. We reuse everything we can. Cooling towers have blowdown circuits. And, and those cycles, you know, dump water out of that tower on a regular basis throughout the day, depending on how much you're running. So we capture that water. We repiped the, the blowdown instead of going to the sewer. We repiped it to back to the lake. We put a meter on it so we collect and see some numbers exactly how much is blowing down. That could be 10,000 gallons a day. Every day you operate, they would have been gone to the sewer system. And not even thinking about the costs, because we pay the city of Turlock to take our, our wastewater. We reduce costs there as well. And so, um, and so, but again, it takes a little bit of extra work in watching chillers, watching boilers, making sure that nothing is getting fouled by the water and stuff like that. So I know I think you had a question, but uh, okay. 
we run up to 1,000. And so we blow down, we run the uh, count at 1,000. And then we start to blow down. But at this point, I'm concerned about the cycles, but I'm also not because I'm not dumping the water and getting, I mean, the water's going back to the lake and then it goes to use for irrigation or recycles back to the tower through the filter. So it works. No, I mean the, the the water the water coming in from the city uh, is pretty close because this is a pretty clean filter. So the water coming in, I mean, you know what? I have two sources for this tower because what if the pump fails? And so uh, automated logic monitors the pressures on the domestic line coming in and also the lake water coming in, and it uses lake water all the time. But if we lose pressure on that loop, it changes to domestic water. But either one I run, the cooling tower will blow down at, a, at the set level. So it may take longer cycles or shorter cycles, but it's still going to blow down at a specific set point. And so, uh, but, um, but in, in our experience has been that my biggest concern was fouling the towers and fouling the chiller tubes. And we're now in our third year, and we open the chillers every year. Works. It works. And we also have a, a vendor for water treatment that is really good. And he's got a uh, treatment process that is environmentally friendly, so there's no concerns about the water going back to the lake. Because we have turtles and fish and duck in the lakes, and it's like, oh, I can't poison this stuff. <laughs> so i got to be very careful. Yeah. And so we well, monitor the lake for a while. Where, where I'm at, all our, well, water, all our water is all water. So when I went to a, a system where I pulled the, the condensate from the building, from mm -hmm. all the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And brought it back to the tower and started using it. Drive drove by a uh, water treatment guy absolutely. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. Nuts trying to figure out why the PDA. Well, I'll tell you what, no, I had those guys involved because I did not want to say oops. And then uh, I had them involved even before we pulled the trigger on this because I wanted to make sure that I was going in with a lot of information. Because this was something different that had not been done. And and if I was gonna screw this up, I will have a very short career. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm, there's somebody back there, and I'll get to you. So, um, have you had a significant change in your water treatment due to bacteria No, no. The water is, I mean, the water comes through this filter is really clean. And that's, that's one of the surprises. It's like, wow, because we open up our chillers every year, and we brush the tubes. And, uh, and we look at, see, we scope it to see how, how they look. We also keep a real close eye on the, on the towers. And we have not seen any significant change. And that's what's, what's, uh, what was amazing to me. Because I figured maybe we had to adjust chemi chemistry. We had to do it because you know how water is. And so and uh, the only cost increase we had was the filter. Oops. Where'd it go? Was the filter. That, that three-chamber filter, we have to obviously, you know, there's a cost involved there. But the savings in water was astronomical. And so now, I mean, Rarely do we use domestic water for the towers anymore. I mean, if there's a failure in the pump and we lose pressure, it'll automatically switch because I got to run regardless. But no, no worries there. I'm, I'm actually really pleased with that. So, yeah, my question was, do you have to retreat the cooling tower water before you put it back in the lake for the fish uh, and turtles? At this point, no, because the, um, the the vendor that is providing water treatment had 20 years of history at a different city in, Tur in, in Fresno that is a hospital <laughs> that took blow down directly from their towers and landscape with it, uh, irrigate the landscape. And all their tests were negative, no, no impact, no effects. But I, I trust people and vendors to a certain extent. <laughs> so I tested the water in the lakes for a while. We're now in our third year. No residuals, no nothing. And the lake is a five million gallon lake that changes over continuously. Because even in the summer months, we have huge influx of water coming in and a l thousands of gallons going out every day because of irrigation pro processes. And so the only thing we have to do to that lake every year, we have to drain it and clean out the, the bottom. But we have to do that regardless because it's runoff from parking lots and streets. So, but do you have, do you, One other question. Do you have any way of replenishing the, the aquifer for your pump? I'm getting to it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. That's the missing link in all this. Um, so in, in all this water reuse and, 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 and recycling, we're always looking for different opportunities. One of the things that our automated logic works to, uh, works uh, and controls is our wastewater treatment, uh, pumping station, not treatment. 
And so the campus obviously has a, a sewer lift station. We monitor this and control it and, and, and look at the volumes of water that goes through this station every day. And it, it is literally 60,000 gallons a day that we pump out to the city of Turlock for, for treatment. And we're looking at this and seeing, hmm, what can we do with this? It's a lot of water. Well, there's, there's a lot of things, different things we can do with it. Uh, this is just uh, the numbers that were collected. But one of the ways that uh, we can do is we can treat it. Cities do it every day. They take wastewater from the city, they treat it, they clean it to a level that is acceptable to be discharged into a river. It's clean water for non-potable uses. Well, there's micro waste treatment plants out there that are basically the size of a flatbed truck that have the capacity to do water treatment for a campus our size. That would be a, a, an additional 60,000 gallons a day in water that we can replenish the lakes for irrigation and, and cooling tower. Now, there's other complications with this because operators have to be licensed. There's all kinds of things. I'm not too keen on this one, but I am really keen is on this one. And I've actually been tasked to do this. A groundwater recharging station. In the Central Valley, because of overpumping and drought over the years, the ground has actually dropped several feet over the last 20, 30 years. It's serious business. And so uh, anything that we can do to put water back, because farming has even changed. It used to be the farmers flood their fields six, eight inches deep and let it all perk into the ground. Not anymore. Things got efficient. Now all the orchards drip, drip irrigation at every tree. No percolation. And we keep taking water out. We pump literally 30, 40 million gallons of water off campus in addition to what we store a year that is lost forever. We want to redirect that stream of water to a groundwater recharging station. It is a very simple system. It is a basin with a porous bottom, nothing fancy in engineering. You pump that water into it and let the earth do its thing. Just let it perk into the ground. The neighboring county has a system like this. This is actually their system. And they use excess water that, that, that uh, on the irrigation canals that the farmers don't use, which ends up going to the river. They redirect it. And in a three-month period, I think it was last year or a year ago, or two years ago, they were able to store, in just that, that window of time, 1,300 acre feet of water just by putting it in there and let the earth do its thing. We have the ground to do it. We have the collection system to do it. We have the control system in place to see what, what, um, what, how much is going where. And instead of sending it out to the river, we want to store it. We take quite a bit out in the summer months to replenish our, our reservoirs. We'd like to put it back. Close the loop, so to speak. And so that's what I'm excited about. I'm actually working on that right now, trying to do it. And, and uh, we're trying to couple it with a building construction project so we can take the, the dirt from to create the basin to supply the dirt for the foundation of the building. We can have them pay for it. Now, you know. <laughs> you know, a question or something. What, uh, what was the time frame between surface water and back to the aquifer? Different regions are in the range of thousands of years. What are you talking about as far as the time frame? It goes quick. Uh, we, the soil out there is, is really good for that stuff. I mean, it's a sandy soil. If you put water in a, in a basin out there, within a week it's gone. And so, and so we're fortunate in that, in that sense. The area is good. And the water levels underground are not that deep. I think they're about 80 feet. But down in the southern part of the valley, it's, yeah, a lot of people lost their, their wells because they just got too, too dry. So, and, and the impact that we're going to have on the environment is minimal. But the fact that I don't have to dump those millions of gallons of water every year makes my day. <laughs> so, so uh, but anyway, so, and I think this, this is it. Yeah. If you, um, if you ever want a, a little bit more information on this, on this, you know, there's our website. We try to uh, share information as much as we can uh, to other um, institutions. This was nothing that was unusually complicated. It's just applying a really sophisticated BAS system and a good contractor can really think, of, think out of the box and says, well, we can do this, we can do that, we can do this. And we, we had a real eye opener because we, we didn't realize how much the sheer volume of water that we were controlling and how to use it. And we saved literally several thousand dollars a year in water costs and, and sewer costs because the blowdown was going to the sewer. We were using five million gallons of drinking water to the plant, to the tower, didn't, didn't need to. Uh, so this had a big impact on our campus. And, uh, and as, as Pam was saying, we actually got a couple of awards for it. Uh, CSU has a, a conference every couple of years. We got a best, best practices award for this, uh, for this project. And then I think it was CHESC or some of those uh, other organizations that, or well, PC APA, that um, recognizes for this. And, so, um, and the only way we're able to do it really is because 
uh, the original designers of the campus put in the, the water collection system in place. And so it wasn't anything we currently did on the local field. It was just that we just applied a different technology to it and really measured it. And so um, I don't know if you guys uh, want or have time. But if I can log in, I can actually log into my campus and show you some of the automated logic um, no, that, uh, that operates the campus. Because we run central plant, we run buildings, we run lighting, everything. So. I have one other question. Do you get any free cooling from those lights? Yeah. Uh, we have a heat exchanger uh, that we don't currently use at this point because I found out that I was using more fan power than I was saving in cooling because we don't use the cooling towers for cooling IT rooms. So the, the temperature difference between the water and the, and the outdoor environment just didn't make sense. Although we're about to tie in uh, uh, the main server to the loop and also student housing which requires cooling overnight because we shut down our children at 11. And so now we may have the coolness of the night. Maybe we'll start using that heat exchanger. And we can through the heat exchanger. We have to increase the size. But we're looking at it every angle. Absolutely, every way we can. Uh, yeah. Another one is uh, we thought about um, doing a buried loop in one of the lakes for just uh, the, for a heat exchanger. But the lakes are not big enough. Uh, the volume of the lake's not big enough. We would heat the lake up and then kill all the fish, and that'd be a problem. Have a lot of problems. So <laughs> anyway, let me see if I can. Um, if I can actually log in here, oops, maybe I can't. Wake up. Let me see. Come on. All right, let me see if I can, if I can't do it quickly, I'll just forget it. I'm not, gonna, I'm not sure I can, I can reach it. Come on. Why not? Oh, okay. Um, I think I lost the connection to the campus, but I think it's, it's, it's back. Okay. Okay, let's see. Let's take something. Uh, let's take Fitzpatrick Arena. This is, um, this is our basketball arena uh, and locker room facility. Um, Obviously, we use thermographics for, uh, to let us know what the temperature set point is, how close it is. Green is obviously uh, right at set point. Blue is slightly on the cold side, maybe a degree below set point. And so by just looking at that the entire building, which doesn't look big, but it's a pretty large facility, you can tell exactly what the temperature set points are on there and how, we're, how well we're doing. And, uh, and it's got three air handlers in the main building. Right, let's take it, uh, this is one of the air handlers. Automated logic is great at giving us information. This is live data exactly. I can actually go in and change set points and start and stop stuff. I draw my operators nuts because <laughs> somebody from behind the, behind the scenes, but uh, whatever. I mean, I, I get valve positions, hot, posi hot coil positions and cold coil positions, fan speeds, airflow, temperatures, um, uh, a very, very uh, robust system. There's the other handler. Uh, we also uh, look at exhaust fans and statuses. And that one's failed, okay. Uh, hot water bridge. This is, again, you see the, the pump turning. This is live data. We're putting out 166 degree water from the plant and we're returning 127 degrees. Not much flow because nobody's calling for heat. 
Um, we look at ele we meter the electric meter at the building, and we look at the numbers. We uh, also uh, monitor in uh, in uh, domestic water. There's nobody in the building today, so 17 gallons is a great day. Um, we even uh, monitor in, in meter chilled water energy, uh, BTU basically, and there's no chillers are not running, but the hot side should be. So you should have some numbers there. Come on, hurry up, there we go. Those are the consumption that the building did today. We'll go down here to the irrigation pumping station, and that's the water uh, management station. We have a deep well that you saw in the presentation. It's not running now because we're not calling for uh, water down there. We have a domestic booster pump system, and that one's failed, oops. Uh, as long as the other one runs, we're good. Irrigation pumps, this is, this is um, again live data. The pump is running, we're not, not seeing any flows. We maintain 85 PSI, and those are the numbers, of, uh, the numbers of gallons that we use today. We're not irrigating today, so no big deal. Storm pumps, should not have ran today, you're right, but they ran yesterday, a lot of water. So that was yesterday's numbers. Today's numbers are nothing, that starts over at midnight. Uh, the Thornburg pump, this is the pump that pumps water off campus. Uh, we change it so we want to store water, but look at the, look at the month today and uh, in the previous month, 11 million gallons. That one is not coming back. The reflection pond, we, re we uh, monitor that front pond. We also have aerators running all the time. Come on. And, um, and what we did here for a graphic is that I didn't want to have a computer generated graphic, so what we did is we took a 12 second or 15 second video of the lake and we looped it, and so that's our graphic. So you'll see the same car passes back there at the same time. <laughs> but instead of looking at a computer graphic, you can see that. So when the lake is scheduled off, you have the same picture, but no water fountains. So, you know, just being creative. Um, we, uh, we, have a, we monitor one of our solar panels. I'm in the process of, um, I mean, solar producing stations. We're in the process of, uh, this thing's getting slow, not, not good. Uh, maybe we're not going to get any more. One thing about automated logic, it is super fast, and uh, I'm surprised that we're having trouble with it. But it's it's my, uh, my ha oops. Well, that may be the end of my presentation. <laughs> so, but anyway, you get the idea. We use it for if I can get, the, we use it for the central plant. We control. We have seven stages of cooling. We have four chillers and seven stages of cooling. You'll start with number three, and then when it maxes out, it goes to number four. When it maxes out, it goes to number five. When it maxes that, which is 1,200 tons, then it keeps five running, starts three. And then when it maxes that out, it stops three, starts four. So, and then it goes all the way up, and then goes all the way back down again at night, and starts to back off. So, um, and I don't know if I can, if I can get it. But um, we, we control all the buildings, we control lighting, we control, um, uh, we even uh, monitor car charging stations around the campus and how much each station is being uh, consumed at each station. And the program actually gives us, um, gives us a, a, a graphic of a different car. Every time somebody plugs in, a car shows up on our screens. <laughs> so, it, my controls contractors are very creative. But anyway, I, I've lost the connection. But you get the idea. I mean, it, it's a, if you have a, a, a robust, sophisticated EMS system on your campus, you're going to save a lot of money and energy. But what you're going to save as well, you're going to save a lot of man hours of troubleshooting. Because we can actually look at a VAV and we can see temperatures in, temperatures out, and valve positions. And from those numbers, you can tell something's wrong. If you have air coming in and 100% chill, uh, chilled water valve and there's no cold air going out, you got a problem. So something, and you can do a lot of, we do a lot of diagnostics and, and correct, correcting of problems throughout the campus from a computer screen. And, and I'm a big believer is that once you correct it here, go out and see it, make sure that you actually did what you thought you did. But, um, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a good investment. And we spent a lot of money in converting the campus to this system, but it's paying off. It's paying off. And the ability to, to do this, because I get alarms at home, which could be a bad thing too, but uh, it's a good thing because when something fails on campus, I get notified. Um, our sewer lift station emails me. It texts me if a pump fails. Uh, if the water in the boilers get too cold, it'll text me. Uh, but the, the best thing is I can call any of my guys and they can log in remotely or even on their smartphone. And they can look at the system live and make corrections and changes. And a lot of times there's an event on campus in the evening, we're all gone, somebody needs a temperature adjustment, log in, change it, done. 
You don't have to get in a car, go down to the campus and do it. So, anyway, hope you liked it. If you got any questions, thanks for uh, listening. Yep. Could you describe your background a little bit, your career trajectory? I'm, I'm an HVAC contractor. Uh, I've been in HVC all my life. I started in the very beginning and, uh, and went through an apprenticeship program. Ne never had the opportunity to go to a four-year college, but got gazillion amounts of training through Ooh. vendors and manufacturers. The nine years that Usimer said was a crash course in building automation. And that was an amazing experience. Latest building technologies, uh, all kinds of trainers and coming in to make sure that we can operate this campus. Um, I spent some years as an, as an engineer at a hospital, as well as an operating engineer. Um, when I went to UC Merced, uh, it was as an operating engineer. And uh, about three months into it, the superintendent for plant operations got ill. And I was uh, recruited to take his place. And this is six months into the campus operation, a new campus, with a gazillion amounts of problems. And uh, because people thought, oh, it was new, what are you guys going to do? Really? And because it's new, there's a lot to do. Um, I was put into a superintendent role and spent nine years there as a superintendent. He came back, but then at the time, mm -hmm. we had grown in staff and the need for another superintendent. So I operated um, the central plant at UC Merced uh, with a staff of uh, not only um, operating engineer, but stationary engineers, because we also ran a steam plant. And so we ran a, a chill plant. And, and the plant was a TES tank for cooling. We only ran chillers at night. We had a two million gallon tank of water and we ran chillers at 100% from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. We chilled those two million gallons of water down to 39 degrees. And then we shut off at 6 a.m. We turned on a pump and we pumped that cold water from the tank through the campus loop and we cooled the entire campus, 1.2 million square feet, all day long without ever starting a chiller. In the middle of summer at 105 degrees. And I had to be convinced. <laughs> yes, sir. It was above ground. It was maybe 20 feet in ground, but it was above ground. And uh, it was 60 feet wide, 100 feet tall, 2 million gallons. And we formed a thermic line like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, was it to the atmosphere? Yes, it was open to the atmosphere. So yes. We had some challenges with treating the water. They actually put in a, a, some kind of a chlorine generator or something because being open, we had to keep, keep after with chemicals. And it cost a lot. The initial treatment of that, of that tank was over $100,000 because 2 million gallons of raw water. But once we treated it, but we had to stay on it. Yeah, it was a challenge. You know, they, exactly. We did all the standards of treatment they needed to do, but w one thing that we had to do actually extra on the tank was to kill biological growth. We actually, <laughs> we actually had a guy come out one time in, in a diving suit and go, man, you were brave, and dive into that sucker. It's like, seriously? And so and took photos inside because two, three, four, five years into it, we wanted to see what kind of the uh, condition the walls in the tank were. And so, um, and, uh, and it, was un <coughs> it wasn't exactly, I mean, it wasn't difficult to maintain because once we put in the proper equipment, uh, it fed uh, chemicals automatically, but it was costly. It, it was, nothing comes, nothing is, is, I mean, you say, oh yeah, we, we ran a really efficient cooling system, and we did, because we ran at night when uh, rates are lower. Outdoor conditions are much different uh, than 105 degree middle of the day, so to reject heat was much easier. So it has some, uh, some really good benefits. The problem with it is that if you had to run those chillers during the day, good luck. They did not run. They could not handle the lift. So we only ran, we only ran at night, and that was by design. They designed them to run no higher than 95 degree ambient. Well, dude, I have 105 degrees in the, in, in all the time. I couldn't run at, at, at daytime. So were they air-cooled or water-cooled? They, they were centrifugal carriers, water-cooled. Were they air-cooled or water-cooled? They're, they're water-cooled. Cooling towers on the roof. And so, but they were designed to bring down that temperature to 39 degrees. They just couldn't deal with high temperatures. The tower temperature, if we got um, 78 degrees or higher, they wouldn't run. So it was a challenge, but it worked. Was there a reason why they chose to just cool water rather than using ice storage? 
Yeah, uh, because I storage, you have to use a brine or a, a right. different, and that there's some problems with that too. It's less efficient. Yeah, and so I wasn't involved in the design. I was just I was just handed the, the plan to run, but um, but and we also ran two chillers in series because you can't. We had water coming back from the campus at 65 degrees, 68, 65 degrees, and they actually uh, incorporated a control system that the water would not leave the building and come back to the plant unless it exceeded a certain level of temperature because if the worst thing that can kill a tank is if you bring cold water back. So we constantly fought with IT people because they said, we want our IT rooms at 70 degrees. Well, that means 55 degree water, 50 degree water. I can't deal that with that in the tank. So we, they had a uh, control sequence in the building that if the water did not get above 60, 65 degrees, it would not leave the building. It would surf back into the building until it got to that point, then it would come back to the plant. And then so we, we maintained that thermocline very easily. Because we had 35, 39 degrees in the bottom and 60s at the top, and in between, somewhere in between. And it was amazing because the computer tracked that, and I knew exactly by looking at ALC and the graphics, and showed me the tank exactly how much energy I had in the tank. And so, and and there been a couple of times that it got inverted, and then you're starting from ground zero, and it's a challenge to get it back. <laughs> so, because you basically have no cooling capacity in the tank. We had one night in the middle of July that IT was out there in full force at midnight. 90 degrees in their, in their room because the tank flipped. And nothing's perfect. But it was a lot of fun, though. But uh, it, it worked. The system worked. I think the challenge that we experienced the last couple, three years I was there is that the campus got too big without expanding the plant. And if you don't have enough energy capacity in the tank to take you from morning till that 9 o'clock hour where you can run at night, you're going you're gonna to exhaust the tank before you can restart chillers again. You're screwed. So we had that problem because the campus got too big. And as I was leaving, they were adding two more chillers. <laughs> so, and I think they changed their operation a little bit because it's interesting that's happening in the, in the electrical industry out there is that it used to be that the, you could not run during the afternoon peak hours. That was the, the no-no. Now there's so much solar production that that peak demand is not as high as it used to be. And so all of a sudden the utility companies are saying, yeah, you can run during, during the day, no problem. So you see Mercedes changed their sequence of They're running children during the day now as well. Because they, they've grown a lot since I've left there. So. But it was a great experience. I learned a lot. TS tanks are a great thing. But their importance and reason for existing is changing. Because um, the reason for not running during the day is going away by solar production. I think the peaks now, the peak demands are going to be at night when all the solar production goes off. <laughs> things, things are changing. So, Yes. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, as far as our sister campuses, if they don't have the ability to collect it, and we just happen to be fortunate enough to do, uh, then it's, it's difficult for them to do. But if you have a point, for example, even this campus, if this campus, all the drain, all the storm drains went to one location, then you can do the same thing we did. You can collect it, pump it into a storage facility. Well, you have to have a lake space. But the campus being that it was laid out so spread out, 220 acres, and, and we are spread out. I mean, it's, it's really a beautiful campus. Um, we have all these lakes. And we actually came into existence because we needed dirt to, to build foundations for buildings. <laughs> so, and they became water features. So, and along with that comes all the, all the other problems they may not want, like geese. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> so nothing's perfect. But uh, we actually pay a guy to come around with his dog and, and kind of sort of herd him around. We can touch him. We can, we can transport him for other locations, but that's all we can do. And we have a, an egg management guy that comes out and oils the eggs in the spring so they don't hatch, because otherwise it'd be overrun. But you got water and food. What do you think? Yeah. So anyway, thank you, guys.